So first of all, I want to thank the organizers for what is every time a terrific meeting and then of course all of you for coming to the session. I am hoping that I have not done something terrible and included too many slides so that we can have some conversation at the end. Um, but I invite you to ask any questions uh, that you may wish. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we think about credit and attribution. How do we reward people who are participating? Um, and and contributing to research efforts or creative efforts, um, and what are some of the cultural and technological issues that are in play here. And this is what actually one of my favorite images, and I, I like it because it shows, you know, we can think about the stars in the sky, but to really recognize the true beauty um, and all of the, the interesting components that make up that starry sky, I think it's much more complicated than what it, you can see at first look, and, and that is shown here as well. Um, uh, in science, uh, there are, um, as with other disciplines, there are all sorts of different things that are happening that um, I think are below the level of being able to recognize them. Can you hear, is there a feedback on the mic? Yes. Okay. Okay, is that better? Okay, great, thanks. Sorry, it was very distracting to me too. <laughs> okay, so first of all, because this is a credit and attribution talk, I wanna take a couple of minutes to recognize the people who have really done all of this work. Um, I wanna recognize the team at Galter Library um, and of course the Northwestern University Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute that we work with. On the um, attribution work that I'll be speaking about later, this has really been champion championed by a couple of key groups. Um, there is a team at Northwestern, Karen Gutzman, um, been part of this group um, since the beginning. Uh, we have uh, the OHSU team. This is led by Melissa Handel, and you can see Nicole and Mary Jane on this. Um, there it was an initiative called Open Vivo, um, and it is an initiative called Open Vivo, where we did a, a first version of a contribution framework and implemented it in a research information system. Uh, there's a paper, and there are a lot of great people there. Um, certainly, the Force 11 Attribution Working Group, a nice. So um, has done a lot of work in this area that we've been able to build on as others, and then uh, Kathy Sarley and Becker Library at WashU. So um, some of the ways that we think about the types of activities that people play in the research realm uh, really relate to biomedical research, but I think some of these lessons can be applied more broadly to other disciplines um, and to other areas of scholarship. There are a number of things, I think, that power research forward that go beyond science, and these are the things that this community is particularly well poised to talk about and advance, things like education and training, working together as healthy and productive teams, uh, developing innovative ideas and carrying them forward. So um, those are all, we're seeing those um, in biomedicine now. And I think, you know, as any of us who are on Twitter know, there's, um, generally speaking, probably uh, it feels like 50 to 60 emails about how flawed impact factor is every day, right? There's a, a tweet every day. Um, but I think uh, we all recognize that uh, when we talk about impact, we're not really looking at which beans we're counting. Um, what we really need to think about are the uh, meaningful changes to, for instance, the way we practice medicine, um, the way we make um, technology or ideas available to our communities, those types of things. Um, that's impact. The problem is, is that it's very difficult to identify and count those things. So that's, that's really the problem. We, um, we have a framework that was set up um, hundreds of years ago with this idea of the paper and so much investment has been made in, in this workflow that we, uh, we've developed a system that makes it easy to count papers. So what we need to do is invest in infrastructure that allows us to be able to identify and recognize some of the other types of things that are being created. So I'm going to talk about a couple things. Um, the first one I wanted to mention is the fact that it takes a village. And I want to use this as an opportunity to highlight some of the terrific work that's already happened. So um, we are uh, certainly uh, not uh, um, starting in this space from scratch. There is um, an amazing amount of work that's been done here. 
Now, uh, credit is, to me, one of the most obvious contributions in this area. Um, there was a, a paper that came out in 2014, work uh, that was championed um, by Liz Allen, Amy Brand, and colleagues, looking at this idea of contributor roles. And this has been implemented in a number of journal systems, where you're able to look at the role of the individual, both um, in terms of that research object, so the publication, but then there is there are a couple of these contributor roles where you're able to recognize their role on the project. Uh, and so um, this, this work moved into um, under the umbrella of CASRAE. Um, they've been championing um, this, you know, a lot of the cultural and technological aspects of implementing this. Uh, I understand that there was a terrific workshop yesterday. I heard a lot of really good things. I unfortunately uh, did not make it in time to uh, attend and so I am gutted and I'll um, hunt down the people who were there uh, so that I can uh, learn more about uh, the details of what was discussed but this is this uh, 14 term taxonomy has really been an incredible addition to the space um, thinking about attribution, we've been doing this in coordination with the Force 11 community for a long time. So we've had two workshops, um, both at Force, Force 2015 and 2016, where we used it as a way to crowdsource community um, identified items that people would like to get credit for. What kinds of roles do you want to get credit for? What kind of research products are you creating that you want to get cr credit for? And to have that be a very open and welcoming discussion so that you're pulling in ideas from the community in, in a ground up uh, approach. We've had an, um, we've also had the opportunity to then take that information from some of these and other workshops and then implement, implement it in a system called OpenVivo. We did that at the Force 16 conference um, and it was really the first um, opportunity to try and uh, implement something like that in a, in a profiling system and I'll talk about that in a minute. I also want to point out there are a couple of other communities uh, who have done a lot of work in this area. As I mentioned, NISO um, has made some incredible contributions here. There's an alternative assessment metrics initiative that was funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And one of the components of that was this idea of um, the output types. And so we developed a schema to try and better identify research output types and present those in a, in a structured form form. Um, and uh, there are a number of other um, activities too. Acumen, um, which is this academic careers understood through measurements and norm, norms activity that's through the University of Leiden, um, as well as a number of different research impact frameworks and research information system schemas um, that all contribute to this ecosystem to kind of see what are the things that are recognized that people want to have present. Uh, what do, uh, what has someone uh, asserted value that there is, that an item or a concept needs to be tracked, and then how do those map to one another? So I mentioned the Open Vivo project. Um, this is, was a terrific initiative. It was very collaborative. I think there were maybe 12 or 15 universities that were represented on the project team. We really wanted to create a research profile system that w was built all on open data. So you, um, you start your profile with your ORCID number um, and you populate it with DOIs. Everything is very open, um, it's very flexible, and it gives you an opportunity to not only ingest those objects that you've created, but you're also able to assert your contributor role on those objects. And so it was a really great learning experience, um, both in terms of how people used it, as well as when we ourselves used it, what do we what what was missing? You know what would have made it easier to be able to apply this. Um, we um, 
made the um, the data is all readily publishable. Um, it can be consumed openly. So this is a an open science leaked open data project. Um, you know, I think the Vivo community has long championed the idea of open data, open processes for everyone, being able to leverage some of this infrastructure and these investments that have been made in terms of persistent identifiers and uh, open data sources. And so this was great. I recognized when I was putting together this slide that I provided my own um, uh, voice of support to myself. So, <laughs> but um, but I wanted to note that you know when I put this um, profile together, it took me 15 minutes to. Um, you know, to plop in my um, ORCID and to pull in a couple of things and to recognize the roles that I had had on projects. So this isn't a burdensome process. And the amount of time that, are, that people are spending curating profiles where the data is not open, <laughs> where you don't have control of your information, where you cannot reuse that data as you see fit, um, I think this is a great alternative and a good way to think about these things. So um, if you'd like to know more, I saw this come through Twitter as I was um, stalking the um, credit workshop yesterday. I wanted to point out this is um, a paper that came out of that Open Vivo initiative. As you can see, this is a pretty uh, nice long author list, um, and it's an open paper. So I encourage you to take a look at it and learn a little bit about the project. One of the things that we um, included in the paper is this idea of the contribution role ontology. Um, and so this is is how we structured this idea of contributor roles and how people can better assert this role in the context of what they're doing. And so here's a, a couple of examples here. So um, when we think about how things are changing, obviously I don't need to talk too much about open science to this crowd. Um, there are a lot of benefits of open science. Uh, but in order to truly understand how open science works, the impact that openness can have on efficiency and effectiveness, we need to be able to measure things. And if we can't get a signal out of the noise, we have a very hard time being able to gather evidence to be able to make these points. And so, um, you know, I think I think this is a great um, kind of immediate uh, reason why uh, we need better ways of tracking and identifying information. Another thing that's recently happened is the National Institutes of Health funded the National Center for Data to Health. Um, we've got the URL there. This is um, an initiative to uh, improve healthcare and research in a way that is a, a has a socio-technical intervention. We're really looking at implementing open science approaches, a lot of team science and collaboration, and really prioritizing good data practices such as interoperability, um, good metadata practices, and so on. It's a very collaborative um, group, and uh, I encourage you, if you're interested, to please let me know. Um, you know, during the course of the conference, I'm always happy to talk about it and share this project. But also, please take a look at the website or join us for some of our community calls. We, um, you know, we actively uh, welcome and seek out voices from the broad community. I think that's the only way that we can move this work forward. So one of the things that we are uh, doing in CD2H is this project called The Informatics of Attribution. Um, as anyone who knows Melissa Handel and I knows that this has been a real labor of love for a very long time, an unfunded labor of love. So, um, but uh, now we have this opportunity. Um, the, the attribution framework was um, spelled out in the FOA for from NIH, and so they wanted a way to be able to think about credit and attribution for the diverse translational workforce. Everybody from the traditional faculty member, but also thinking about other people who need credit for their work. Programmers, data scientists, clinical research coordinators, all sorts of different people. And so what we're trying to do is think about this in kind of a holistic way. Um, and you can kind of see how that works here. We've got a couple of 
so we have um, NIH. NIH has to be on the image. Um, so they've issued a couple of awards here if we look at this framework. I want to point out there is only one paper on this grid. <laughs> so that's really the only thing that is recognized by traditional mechanisms to identify and credit work is the publication and the grants. So there's two grants and one publication. We have um, researchers that are leveraging a data warehouse. Those are incredible infrastructure initiatives with a lot of scientists working behind the scenes to make those kinds of resources available. Um, that usually not credited um, or, or forgotten in the acknowledgments, very difficult to find. Um, we also um, have, down at the bottom, we have at Institution X, we have a programmer um, who is working on a GitHub project and they're building software and they're actively contributing to the open source community um, and getting contributions from the open source community. So we have our researcher B um, puts together a protocol and leverages a data set and software on their big research project. That is a technical term, big research project. And, um, and then we have that paper, but researcher B is usually the only person and, and the individual in researcher B's lab that will show up as authors on the, on the paper. And so that can be a real problem. And I think that that's a, a great um, setting to help to um, encourage people to talk about what kinds of roles are you playing in this space? What do you want credit for? What kinds of interesting things are you creating? Because it goes far beyond papers. So, um, you know, with this, with this whole project, this Informatics of Attribution um, initiative, even though we've been thinking about it for a long time, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think it's been possible to do it until now. You know, we've had all of these you know, kind of grand schemes and ideas, but uh, it really hasn't been the right time. There's always something that doesn't work. Um, but now I think we have an opportunity where there, um, there's great data available to be able to think about these things. Investments at the infrastructure level at a number of institutions as well as some of the biggest players in this ecosystem, the publishers, scholarly societies, federal funders, those kinds of things. Um, we have this acknowledgement that we are more than just the tenure track faculty members. Other people, we need to better represent research in general. Um, and we need to recognize all of those kinds of, of um, activities. There's certainly been a, a huge push to better assess and evaluate biomedicine recently, um, especially in the context of some of the research assessment frameworks around the world. Um, and those are starting to trickle influence, it feels like, is starting to trickle into uh, the United States as well. Um, so I think you know we've got the the culture is right, the data um, are right, the systems are maturing, and so this seems like a great opportunity um, to execute on. So when we think about research impact, I think, um, and this might be um, influenced by my perspective, my own professional training, but I tend to th think about basic science. You know what's happening in the laboratory, and. Um, but when you think about the types of activities that really need to be recognized, it's a little more than you know, those experiments. There are um, major problems with even recognizing the people who are part of those environments. And so here's a couple of initiatives that I wanted to point out, although there are many others. Um, these are both focused on Wikipedia. <laughs> Um, uh, there, uh, Jess Wade is a physicist uh, in England who has been writing Wikipedia pages for women physicists and, and other scientists. I mean, just to have that kind of um, that um, ability to present these diverse and underrepresented individuals in the context of their work and their knowledge contribution, I think, is an incredible addition uh, to the conversation. Um, and, you know, and so on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, and, and the same thing uh, uh, in mathematics as well. But I, you know, I wanted to close just thinking a little bit about um, what do we want, um, what do we want 
impact mean? What are the kinds of things that we want to be able to capture and catalog and better represent? It's not even the people who are in the lab or in the clinical environment, it's our communities. So we have a number of initiatives where we are engaging the community in a number of activities. We have patient representatives on, um, on boards. We are um, out in the community. This is a project called <laughs> Chicago Check. It's Chica the Chicago Cancer Health Equity Collaborative. As you can see, um, I mean, I love this project. Um, they're very engaging and they are partnering with the community. The community members are real members of the research team. And how do we recognize them? You know, I mean, they're, they're, this is kind of a big problem. There are lots of people who need recog you know, recognition. So it all comes down to technology and culture. I, I wanted to put a plug in for the next generation repositories work that's happening at CORE. I love um, the promise of this because it really does give us a way to think about research um, and research objects in a way that puts, um, puts responsibility and power in uh, the arms of the institutions and it elevates the resource above the technology stack to help to promote discoverability um, and so on. So um, I do not have time to talk about uh, the team scientist uh, track at Northwestern, but um, we recently um, did a survey, and it's it's working. You know, trying to look at new ways of of acknowledging um, contributions for people who are doing team based activities, and so I'll throw that out as a as a little. Um, you know, just as a little crumb, um, and I welcome any kind of questions. But, um, you know, ultimately, we really need to look for resources and approaches that promote interoperability, good practices, and all of them require uh, collaboration. So if anybody is interested in, um, you know, in the CD2H stuff or any of the other things I've mentioned, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk about it um, and share information with you. And, uh, and I guess I'll end there and open it up for questions. Thank you. And I think we have a couple of minutes. We've got um, maybe five minutes or so for questions. Yes, ma'am. To what extent are the hiring and firing of tenure committees have actually taken on board what we're doing and using it to evaluate that's a great that's a great question. So the question is how much are the hiring committees and PNT committees taking what we're doing and leveraging it in a real way? So we have a couple of initiatives that we're working on right now at Northwestern where we're implementing these uh, contributor roles in the context of um, critical references forms. So these are like your heavy hitter, these are my best things I've created. There's a list of five outputs. And then you annotate those based on your role. And so we're right now kind of testing that and seeing how that works. And uh, we're looking to implement it as part of a responsible metrics pol policy on campus and a number of other things as well. But this team scientist track is, um, I think it was rolled out in 2015. It, it's great, I'm on it. Um, and I love it because you are given guidance and they actually care that you're doing collaborative work. It's kind of the first time that that's been slightly celebrated. Yes. From a publisher point of view, what can publishers do to support the work? Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, so publisher's point of view, how can publishers get involved and support the work? So the work that we're doing now on the attribution project, we're really looking at marrying that bottom up with the contributor ontology and the top down with the already existing and implemented credit um, and, and trying to build something that's um, straightforward, easy to think about implementing, um, you know, can uh, cannot be too much of a disruption to the publication workflows that are already existing. Um, and, uh, and so for anybody, publishers, scholars, community members, anybody, we welcome input, you know, so this is the time to get involved and kind of tell us what needs to be happening too. What are the pain points and opportunities and so on. Yeah, Ian. So to do systems to work well, you need to have, I think, uh, a really good uh, collection of good identifiers and good data that can 
together. Here, here. <laughs> yes. Do you have an order of magnitude sense of kind of what percentage coverage is today on the, on the domains that you're, you, you, you want to service? How yeah. far do we need to go for it to be a universal solution? That, that's, um, that's a great question. So I think um, in terms of domain coverage, we're fortunate because there has been such an incredible investment in biomedicine and the sciences. So um, fortunate in that that's what my domain is, you know, yeah. so it's easier to think about those things. I, it's not so great when you are in other disciplines and that makes it very difficult. I don't have a good um, handle on what what might be missing, but that is a, that's, I mean, that's such a good question because we've been, you know, kind of, you feel like you're carrying around a bag that's too full and about to split all the time with this project. And so now that we're ready to start, we're really kind of stepping through the doorway on this project and ready to roll it out. So that's why I'm encouraging folks, if you're interested, you know, please get in touch with us because now is the time to get involved and we'll have a better handle on that. Yeah, not this week, but. <laughs> Yeah. Is this working? Oh, um, <laughs> uh, so um, at Gigasense, we've been using the, the Casfi credit tax on mm -hmm. for a while. eLife, other publishers have been collecting this data. But at the moment, it's just getting, if, if anything, just dumped in a big table at the bottom of the paper and, and kind of right. lost. So um, Open Vivo, other schemes, is, are there any, do you have any thoughts on how we can better visualize, um, display these things, actually get people to, to, you, to use it? You know, there was Paper Badger from Mozilla for a while, but I don't think that's working mm -hmm. anymore. So. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I didn't mention, but it was a real output last week, is that we now have a computable credit model, um, uh, an ontology for credit um, that was published. It's just an OWL file. So I think having computational approaches to make things things happen, you know, help the machines be able to parse the data. It makes it easier to display it as well. Um, I also think that we need to think a little bit about um, the roles and how they might be conflated in the context of a research output as well as a research project. You know, to kind of help tease those things apart because you can have individuals who are contributing to research projects, major contributions, but um, you know, if you look at some of the guidelines on authorship, they may not qualify for authorship, but I think we all know those individuals on our own teams, if they weren't there, there wouldn't be anything. So, you know, how do we do a better job of kind of figuring out that, those levels of contribution as well? But yeah, it would be nice if we could do something shiny and visually appealing. Yes. Oh, I think. Oh. So Plus has implemented something that's kind of like the paper badges. Yeah, thank you. I keep forgetting to look over here. And you did that? No, I'm sorry. I was just answering the former question. Plus has actually implemented something. They're using credit system. And they've implemented something that shows um, the roles. If you go to an HTML page and then now oh, it's that's great. one of the authors, you can see it. Uh -huh. so it's on the XML. So it's uh, it's yeah. XML, too, which is in the recommendations. OK, is the next speaker here? Thank you very much, very much everyone. <laughs>